Thank you. Usually I speak about state parks uh, of the New Deal era, so in, and this um, symposium has given me an opportunity to take a look at an earlier project, but with new eyes. Um, I'm going to talk today about the convergence of automobiles, of roads, of early tourism, and tea rooms. Tea rooms allowed neophyte travelers just after World War I to explore the countryside in comfort and with great confidence. In the past several decades, tea rooms have interested a few scholars and and uh, a few have actually uh, looked and studied them, but they've done so from the point of view of what their menu is. You know, Foodways is a, is a great historical inquiry these days, and um, uh, menus, foodways, that sort of thing is, is, has um, interested historians, as well as gendered space. They've been looked at in that way. They've been looked at also as the first step in the feminization of um, the restaurant business. But no matter what the perspective of the inquirer, inquirer is, um, they primarily look to urban tea rooms. And um, several years ago, I too looked at them, uh, and I viewed them as part home part business establishments that uh, American women use strategically and creatively to occupy public spaces by extending their domestic talents of cooking, entertaining, and decorating. This year's con conference motivates me to look at tea rooms anew and examine the rural subset of these eateries through the prism of roadside architecture. I want to place them in the context of American landscape history and urge for their fur further identification, interpretation, and preservation. The term tea room really covered a diverse um, a range of establishments. They could be in Greenwich Village, they could be in department stores, they could be uh, in the suburbs on main thoroughfares, and they could be located on uh, roads connecting rural communities. They described a vast array uh, of places that extended from Maine to California and operated by people who had very little else in common. They served different purposes. Some of them were philanthropic. If a church needed to raise some money, they started a tea room. If uh, uh, a mill went out of business to employ the unemployed young women, uh, a tea room was, a, was an option. And sometimes it was for the profit of the individual tea room operator. The stereotype is that only women, uh, 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 middle class, Upper middle class women uh, dine there, but plenty of shop girls and school children, bridge clubs, and, and yes, men dine there as well. They tried in an era of standardization to be fairly, or to be unique, and they succeeded in many cases. Some res restaurants really did, uh, were called tea rooms. I mean, if, if they're so diverse, then why is there even a phrase tea room? Um, most of them were operated by women, oftentimes two women, who sought to combine their, their individual skills. One individual would be at the, at the um, uh, uh, cooking the food, and the other one would be serving and hostessing. They, many of them were located in standing buildings, and so it took the elbow grease of the women to uh, repurpose those uh, interior spaces. And more than 
any other conventional restaurant tea rooms and their operators effectively mediated between dining in private and dining in public by applying the rhetoric of domesticity to food eaten away from the home and by creating a public approximation of home environment and home cooking. We know about 20th century tea rooms by virtue of the literature that exists about them. Um, pick up a uh, home, um, uh, uh, good housekeeping, pick up um, House Beautiful, The Delineator, The Journal of Home Economics, or Country Life in America. And you can see from the period of about 1915 to about 1930, uh, uh, an article. During the 1920s, there was even a, a journal, and it was called the Tea Room Management, and then later it was, uh, the name was changed to Tea Room and Gift Shop. Articles stressed that not only were some tea rooms in homes, or that they looked like homes, but they felt like homes. There were poems, photographs, printed articles that portrayed intimates enjoying refreshments in settings with very cozy furniture, charmingly mismatched furniture, uh, ceramics, colorful fabrics, and flickering fireplaces. Tea rooms felt, in short, like homes in a world that was increasingly impersonal. Young women and men had left the farms for cities that could not house them. Immigrants without places to live had arrived in record numbers. Urban dwellers who felt that the cities were uncaring carved out suburbs for themselves near workplaces. In this flux, urban and suburban tea rooms were convivial places for women to gather, and countryside tea rooms provided motorists and other travelers with approximations of home. Now, there's some consensus on when tea rooms uh, came about. Uh, uh, some scholars believe that it was the, uh, the mid-19th century in French department stores. Certainly by the late 19th century, as uh, young women were taking, uh, young American women were taking the, the grand tour, they were encouraged in some of the travel literature to go to the ABC tea shops in, in London. That was one of the first tea shops, uh, tea shop chains, chain. It was aerated bread company, and you see an image of the, of the interior here. Um, and then, um, uh, and then uh, it, they were picked up by the 1880s uh, in, in um, large department stores in Chicago and New York. I want to briefly and superficially identify some of the contexts in which tea rooms uh, developed, whether urban or rural. And um, one of those is its aristocratic connotations. The other one is just the enthusiasm for all things that were Japanese at this time, beginning after the Mikado became very popular in the 1880s and, and toured uh, around the U.S. But um, they were also legitimized as um, businesses that women could uh, undertake because it was a natural extension of hotel keeping. But it was two other uh, context that I'm, again, I'm going to mention briefly, and, and 1920 is the year that's important to both of them. Women's suffrage, women's rights, and prohibition. Um, briefly, from Seneca Falls in 1848 onward through the second half of the 19th century, uh, women's, women's voices rose up in a um, for abolition, for temperance, for suffrage, but there were some competing groups. Uh, it wasn't all smooth sailing, but by the end of the 19th century, um, leisured women and uh, 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 social activism 
um, broke down some of those barriers, broke down, well, is it federal or is it local action? What's really keeping us behind? Is it family responsibilities, lack of access to the marketplace? Is it our lack of voice in political uh, debates? But by um, the late 19th century, there was a surge of volunteerism and it brought together activists and all of these uh, members of women's clubs and professional societies. And um, this not, uh, they all came together in the National American Woman Suffrage Association, which melded some of those interests and um, helped vanquish some of those disagreements. The nation's need for women's support during World War I, made clear by President Woodrow Wilson, gave women an added uh, at leverage. And eventually, tea rooms and other places gave, um, and other establishments gave women a place in the marketplace. Prohibition also helped to popularize uh, tea rooms. The 18th Amendment was in place uh, from 1920 to 1933. And prior to uh, Prohibition, at the turn of the century, the world of restaurants really consisted of hotels and bar restaurants and working class saloons. These were largely male preserves. And it was the fine hotel that offered a separate uh, dining space for female customers. Receiving most of their profits from liquor sales, restaurateurs of high quality establishments could treat their male patrons to expensive meals served in ample quality quantities. But the temperance movement had long advocated alternatives to such restaurants. And when prohibition took effect in 1920, many of those elegant dining places went out of business. So spurred by prohibition and ready to profit were in the wings uh, soda fountains, luncheonettes, cafeterias, and tea rooms. Unlike hotel restaurants, which were often expensive and inconvenient, and cafeterias were, um, they lacked charm and any warmth, tea rooms, on the other hand, were distinctive and uh, attractive places to eat. As women's public voice strengthened and prohibition became law, tea rooms rode with a tide. Now, Consider the rural tea room. I'm gonna to try to give you very briefly some context for that, for uh, the rural tea room. Uh, some of those were roads, automobiles, tourism, and the country life movement. Um, the, there was a, a, a large system of uh, unimproved roads in the, in the US before um, 1900, but we know that after the National Road was built, it was really up to uh, local governments to provide. They had no money uh, either, and so um, uh, it, it really took the 1916 Highway Act to get a tax on gasoline in order to, to fund the improvements. Reba talked a little bit about um, the number of automobiles and roadways that extended from, uh, or that um, burgeoned after uh, the turn of the century. Here are a couple of graphic illustrations. And of course, the Model T. There were um, about 600,000 motor vehicles in 1913 in the world. And by 1925, there were 17 million automobiles registered just in the United States. The, uh, the Model T was very, very popular. Its high chassis and its cheap price made it a perfect uh, vehicle for farmers. And, and you know, the idea was to get the farmers out of the mud. And um, as, as the Model T's uh, price decreased over time, yes, decreased. Uh, other car manufacturers came in and uh, stepped into the, the breach. 
Driving these vehicles on these improved roads were tourists who were newly leisured Americans in exercising freedom to enjoy weekend adventures, antiquing especially in the Northeast. In the 1920s saw a common culmination of a century long work reduction movement as labor turned to the five day work, work week and shorter work days. As organized labor pushed for further reductions, leisure and recreation became public and political issues. Public recreation facilities such as parks and playgrounds, community centers, and national parks also founded uh, in this time. Uh, the automobile opened vistas to the newly mobile public. So enter tea rooms. Tourists who were venturing outside the city, it was said, needed a home, not a hotel. And uh, those individuals who were rushing through the countryside didn't really need a heavy meal, taken at a leisurely, pro uh, leisurely pace and a high price. They needed instead delicious vegetables, fresh from the garden, cool salads, ice drinks, and this is what the wayside tea room, tea room affords. In the literature about rural eateries, there's a, there was a conflation of roads, automobiles, and tea rooms. Commentators often mention the trio in a single breath or in a sentence or two. For example, unlike until the automobile was graduated from the class of luxuries into that of necessities, tea shops were successful only in the large cities. Today, they flourish in the smallest burg and flaunt their copper kettles and blue teapots on every broad highway. Improved roads was re were really good news for the tea room. When a road becomes paved, one enthusiast declared, that road begins to wake up and take a new interest in life, and the field for the rural tea houses expands. It was as if roads married automobiles, and together they begat tea rooms. Contributing to what I am calling the conflation of roads and vehicles, travel and tea rooms, was a man named Frederick W. Baker. For him, the boundaries of roads and motor cars and restaurants was very fluid. In fact, he went from editing the Good Roads man magazine to editing tea room management. He began his uh, career at tea room management by, uh, by changing its name to tea room management, um, to tea room and gift shop. For some tea room patrons, the makes and models of the cars parked at a tea room functioned as an index to, mission, to menu prices and the statuses of the clientele. As one patron Riley wrote in a tea room guest book, look at the prices and watch the Fords go by. <laughs> some um, tea rooms, especially those featured in House Beautiful, subscribe to the philosophy that people who worry about prices, really, you don't want them in your, in your tea room. Um, those, who, those in the know really understand that the, tea, that the rural tea room, uh, the season is short and you can't do excellent food at bargain basement prices. Such comments assured magazine readers that they would be among their equals at the roadside tea room. We can only imagine motorists who decided whether or not to stop at a particular tea room by virtue of what cars were parked outside of it, whether they were the Fords, the Rolls Royces, uh, whether they avoided one or the other. Uh oh. Um, 
Of course, motorists might assign chauffeurs of the task of evaluating the tea room. And one very clever marketing tea room operator decided that she would make a chauffeur tea, uh, and so a, a separate space. And so she was able to attract chauffeurs um, to her place. And she said, um, that's much better than um, asking the chauffeurs to play wooden Indian while their employer is teeing. Now, tea room fare could refresh the weary traveler, but it could also be the enemy of tourism. Yes, the eateries could make the rest part of travel an end in itself. But there was such a thing as being too comfortable amid pleasant surroundings and delicious refreshments. More than one observer noted that vacationists would arrive at a scenic or historical destination only to stop and enjoy the tea room hospitality for so long that they missed viewing the sights. Periodicals packaged roads, autos, tourists, and tea as opportunities. For the traveler, it was a comfortable and healthy excursion. For the tea room owner, a profitable business. Others who benefited were the transporters who pushed good roads and automobile manufacturers who wanted to expand their markets. Still others, though, perhaps less obvious, had a stake in the success of the roadside tea room and saw its value for farming communities and villages. These were early 20th century reformers concerned about rural life. They were educators, they were economists, they were teachers and rural sociologists who were variously involved in, a, a, in movements such as Good Roads, City Beautiful, and Country Life movements. I'm going to talk now about the Country Life movement. Now, right before Theodore Roosevelt uh, was exiting uh, office, he, did, he convened a commission of country life, and this was about 1909. And it, within four months, this blue ribbon panel was supposed to survey uh, uh, farms and uh, supposed to discuss this, the current social, economic, and educational conditions in the country as a means to remedy deficiencies. They conducted the interviews and they urged locals to have public meetings. And the commission, after again, after only four months, published the report of the Country Life Commission, which was in 1911. And the recommendations in there stood as a, um, as a roadmap for the country life movement for another a decade or more. The country lifers were uh, fearful that the countryside was losing its population to cities. The commissioners generally agreed that something was deficient in rural life and um, they wanted the, the country values to come to the city and the city to take its money out to the country. Bad roads were one thing that stood in the way. So in addition to um, recommending uh, improved roads, they also recommended creating cooperative organizations uh, of farmers to improve their situation, to bolster scientific education uh, of uh, agriculture in rural schools. And they wanted the churches to move from away from doctrine to just generally improving community life. Uh, tea rooms appeared to satisfy both sides of the country life movement, those who thought that farms should be operated more as a business and those who thought farm life was filled with routine and, and drudgery. Excursionists would need a place to stay after all they reasoned and what better place than the rural tea room. That sense of larger purpose infused some of the um, uh, writing about rural tea rooms. There was an editor uh, by the name of Walter Dyer who wrote an article, a 
community tea house, a simple clubhouse in villages or real country, one solution to the problem of how to bring new interests and human contact into the life of the farmer's wife. He described a typical uh, tea room, and he said, you know, you, you can make, um, you can design a tea room just that looks just like this, but it needs to have a mission, and that was to bring consumer and producer into the uh, same space. Um, let's see, I'm out of time. Okay. Um, now, Dyer uh, complained that he only knew one place that that fit this bill, but actually the readers of his House Beautiful would have likely known many other places. While not able to improve the lot of farm women through government action, magazine readers may have been motivated to help rural women via influential women's clubs and urban civic service groups to which they belonged. And certainly the, the um, publications on tea rooms uh, describe a number of these uh, tea rooms with a mission. Um, I want to conclude by suggesting that tea rooms and country life had another perhaps more tenuous connection to cultural landscapes. The movement con uh, voiced concerned about abandoned farms as well as a commitment to land preservation and community preservation. Its desire to reinvigorate country life and to some extent vacant buildings, some of them or were historically important, was in the spirit of adaptive reuse or repurposing or reviving. No matter their location, tea rooms and proponents of them often invoked tradition or history as a legitimizing factor. They appropriated colonial revival material cliches, preparing simple food and fe featuring handcrafted gifts. Now, I grant that some of the establishments were, in fact, built as tea rooms, like the, the one here, Gregoryville, uh, Kentucky. But the other one that's featured is in the Astor Stable, uh, Tally Ho Tea Room. Consider two buildings that did not look like homes or had not for some time, but were converted into home-like places. There, one article kind of, uh, title kind of sums it up. Do you own a barn? an old mill, or a tumble-down house. Uh, they put uh, Montana, uh, uh, an entrepreneur in uh, uh, Montana, built her tea room out of a chicken house. Uh, women all over the country transformed abandoned historical buildings um, into colonial revival tea rooms. Um, this is an example of, um, of a couple, one in Ohio, one in Massachusetts. Their ephemeral use make, uses make identification and docu documentation difficult. For example, some opened only seasonally during the summers, and many tea rooms were short-lived, as evidenced by uh, this. Uh, don't get too attached to the place where you like to uh, buy and eat homemade jam and clotted cream. Pass that way a month later, and the chances are that a grimy window will hold a sign for rent, and only empty screw holes will remain to show where once the inviting tea shop sign hung. So it's, it's a short chapter sometimes in the history of a building, such as the uh, Sweat Isley House out of historic New England. It's, it was located on uh, uh, Newbury's most traveled road. It operated uh, as a tea room during the 1930s to get it over the um, Great Depression. Um, I know of no comprehensive list of historical tea rooms. That certainly, there are city directories, there are travel guides, WPA guidebooks list some of the um, 
places in scenic tourist locations. Habs is another place to look. But <clears throat> overall, identifying and documenting tea rooms are local and state undertakings that only eventually could culminate in a national database. Only three that I've located are on the National Register, uh, featured here and here. Okay. This has been an introduction to tea rooms and a call to arms or a challenge to locate them on the American landscape. Their messages are rich, for they tell us about how Americans embraced the new technology of the automobile, what propelled folks to take to the road, what they enjoyed of the new and what they clung to of the past as they traveled on improved roads, and what conveniences made them comfortable and confident as they motored along. Tea rooms remind us that for all those living in 1920s America, taking a simple meal on the road was not all that simple a matter. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take time for one question for Cindy. That's okay. You had some interruptions, so. Do we have a question for Cindy? Um, thanks, Cindy. That was really interesting. I did not know anything about tea rooms. Um, I'm wondering when you show the slides with the the gentleman in the dining hall, and then you know some of these other women. Were there any tea rooms for like, you know, African American women, or were they the taking advantage of this? Um, they were primarily in the kitchen. And there, um, Alice Foote McDougall was a very big um, uh, tea room owner in New York City. And there was a movie loosely based upon her life. And, um, oh gosh, um, An Imitation of Life is a, is a movie you might want to look at. It's, um, there is a, a gentleman who's doing a, a book on Route 66 through um, Texas, the, that stretch. And um, he may have found a, an African-American tea room. I'm not, I'm not sure. He's not sure. But um, I've looked in the green book, and I, I don't see any restaurant that is is named tea room but I need to look again I've found no no photographs um, a lot of times tea rooms morphed into hostess houses during World War uh, one and there were indeed African American hostess houses and hostess houses were those uh, properties that were on training grounds, training uh, camps, and they were places that were gendered that the soldiers could meet their girlfriends, sisters, wives. They were safe places on a training uh, camp. So um, I think those two are tied, but, but no, for the most part, it was an African-American cook. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 